Nice codify our common knowledge and experience and make medicine relevant to all of us practicing in the community. So one such example is the practice of geriatric medicine. Geriatric medicine is not easy to practice as a solo GP or as a solo home care doctor. So we, we have to work in a team frequently. It's not easy to organize it. And um, so in order to provide the best quality care, otherwise um, uh, it's, it's not, it, because of the tremendous amount of work, I, it's, it's quite understandable that many of us would uh, tend to refer patients to the emergency department or the hospitals, which is actually sometimes not the best uh, options for, for the patients. So through this work, um, that is the implementation and introduction of inter uh, standardized community assessment tools, we hope to improve on the whole ecosystem. So today, um, we'd like to introduce everybody to, to, to this particular um, instrument, and I'll do my best to make it applicable to the doctor. Because aging and geriatric patients is not the doctor's only prerogative, not our only domain. So you'll find that it's very multidisciplinary, but I hope you can see that doctor has an important role here. So let me uh, share my slides and uh, keep the ball rolling. I'd like to start off with some provocative uh, uh, discussion on why do we want to have a standardized comprehensive geriatric assessment. In a way, aren't our training and our heuristic intuitive approach to care good enough? So of course, as clinicians, we are very fluid. We want to be very flexible. That is right and good. But when it comes to big numbers, we may need to do this. So let me explain my case. So we know that uh, i like to also um, sort of uh, reference you to um, the, the lecture two months ago when we talk about uh, diet and nutrition for the frail elders. And I started the uh, discussion with uh, introduction to the concept of frailty. So frailty, you can think of it as symptomatic phenotypic frailty where you have a walk, low in walking skit. But there's also another group of thinkers who conceive frailty as a kind of cumulative deficit as a person age and grow elder, older. And this to us as a clinician is more palpable in the sense that we do see certain groups of patients because of age they have got multiple chronic diseases. So how do you make sense of it? So the National Frailty Strategy has a policy report has been published last year, sometime in July. And one of the recommendations, this is a summary of it, is this one. For patients with clinical frailty scale, four to five, that means they, they are slowing down even though they are independent in instrumental activities of daily living, that's four or five. They've got some deficit in instrumental activities of daily living. They should be screened with ICOP screening tool, which screen for six deficit. If any one of them is abnormal, they should have a CGA. So this is described here. And anyone with CFS more or equal to six, which is among the various basic ADLs, they are not totally independent. You are already six. If you're six, then you should also receive a CGA. CGA stands for Comprehensive Geriatric Assessment. So you can do CGA, you can do interact checkup, you can also do risk factor specific tests. I can have a, a combination of MMSE or AMT plus geriatric depression scale plus Patel index combination. So this is um, something that is recommended based on this national strategy. Okay, then what is the implication for us? Because this is a national policy direction. So for frail elders, of course, they, as community physician, we need to handle them. Most of our patients, community aged care physicians, whether you're working in nursing home, working in home nursing foundation as a home care physician, or any other um, uh, services, whether it's for profit, non-profit, taking care of homebound elders, they are most of the time CFS 6 or more. So we should perform comprehensive geriatric scale uh, um, assessment for all our patients. But you know, it, take, it is time consuming. How are you going to operationalize it? I mentioned Akan Datang. So today is the day okay, that uh, time has come. Then we'll be discussing on this. CGA is not just directed 
it's just not, not to be done for its own academic purpose. It's actually in order for us to identify care needs so that our care plan is directed to areas of needs and not just diseases. Okay? And in the community, because we are targeting a community care physician, not in the hospitals, we have to have the social dimension. We need to assess social strength, whether there's caregiver, whether they've got money, whether there are steps leading up to their, their, their flat, or they sleep, staying in um, condo blocks where neighbours do not know each other, what kind of vulnerabilities are there, caregivers are they stressed. So in the community, the psychosocial dimension is very important. And also at near the, the frailty or near the end of life, the priorities start to shift. It's not always about survival, and we all know from experience. And because of frailty, there's vulnerability. As physicians, we need to know diseases do not present typically. Most of the time, it's not one diagnosis, but there are many comorbidities interact to create a certain syndrome, including the influence of polypharmacy. And then there's a lot of cognitive impairment and prevalence of demoralization and other psycho-emotional health issues. As doctors, we call it depression. But when you go into community, you know depression is too simplistic a term. It's a kind of mix of stress with grief, with identity loss, with depression, with anxiety, and so on. So this is something very important for us working in the community. Functional decline as a, as a, as a presentation of acute illness, and also functional decline means increased resources, and severe frailty implies pro prognosis, and all of us need to be aware of palliative care working in the community. So now, today we are talking about why standardized assess, geriatric assessment. Before that, I'd like to talk about what is geriatric assessment. So this is very old from 1993, but I took it just today from up to date. So people are still using this particular definition for what is CGA. So CGA is defined as the multidisciplinary diagnostic and treatment process that identifies medical, psychosocial, and functional limitations of a frail older person in order to develop a coordinated plan to maximize overall health and aging. So I'd like to highlight a few key terms. There is multidisciplinary. There is a, it's a diagnostic as well as a treatment process. It identifies medical, psychosocial, and functional limitations of a frail elder. So this is addressing frailty. So um, referencing our National Frailty Protocol. This is a bit later. It's 2020. So this group of researchers codify the principles in geriatric care. So now there's a little bit more dimensions. You look at the far left column, identifies problems across health and social care. So you can see medical and medicines use, functional, psycho. Psycho, I suppose, will include cognitive and mood. Mental health is mood or cognitive and mood. Social, environmental and spiritual. So this bio, psycho, social plus spiritual, Environmental, sometimes people subsume under psycho. Economic is under environmental. So you can see it is multi-domain. But that is not enough. You need to establish priority. So you have a multidisciplinary approach to assess, but you must also identify individual goals for the current and the future. So ACP is important so that you have a direction to your care plan and then you do intervention. So this is, um, uh, this is um, principles of geriatric Comprehensive geriatric assessment. So how do we make geriatric assessment more person-centered? I mean, in the community, we know we are going to the house. It's not that they come to our clinic. They are the boss. They are the they are the they are the they are the they are the, the owner of the domain. Okay. So we go there, we are guests. We need we if we are not person-centered, then um then then it's very hard for us to connect. So to be person-centered, you cannot just be applying CGA, looking for deficits, and we impose on goals. So how do we make CGA more person-centric? Referencing the American Geriatric Society's definition of person-centered care, the person's values and preferences must be elicited, just like how we do ACP. Now it's about present care plan. You need to have their preferences elicited. It should guide all our healthcare. So how do we do that? So with the assessments, we cannot just be assessing weakness, limitations. We must also assess what's the strength and resources because we have to make use of their strength to overcome their own weaknesses in order to achieve the goal. So goal has to be established by the, 
the patients and the families. Of course, as professional, we also need to recommend and guide. Then you identify care for Kai. So in person-centered care, we don't call things as problems or diseases. Many, because that's um uh, it, it doesn't it, it sounds um negative. So we say this is area of care, and then we create a care plan. We have intervention in order to reach the person's goal. The goal can be palliative, it can be rehabilitative, it can be curative, or it could be just well-being, you know, in order for them to, to do something of meaning. Then where does where do we make it really person-centered? It's an element of prioritization based on the person's preferences. I put up this slide in a in sense that you, you may want to do a CGA, you may want to standardize it, but we must not lose sight of the person involved. So in order to do that, we still need to have some kind of prioritization where the older person or the clients and the families are involved. So now I would like to open the floor for some kind of brainstorm. And so we're opening up for you to access the chat. I'd like you to answer three scenarios. Up to you. If you're very, if you're driving, then you please don't participate. If you're like eating, you can type, okay? Or if you're really you no know, listening, you can of course contribute your ideas. So let's I I let's let me use a typical community case. This is Madam Lee. She's 85-year-old li lady living with her 56-year-old daughter who has mild intellectual disability. The older lady is getting frail, and while she's still able to manage her ADL. Going out to the neighborhood is actually getting more and more difficult for her. Why? Because she's more forgetful. She has been hospitalized more than once just within this year. One was for fall, another for fever. So every time a senior goes into hospital and out, we know there's a little bit of decline in terms of deconditioning. And sometimes for fall, you can actually have a post-traumatic kind of fear of further fall, which is very common in the community. So this is why idea is getting more difficult. The hospital diagnosed as cognitive impairment surely must be that the doctor wants to follow up with CT brain and lab tests before they confirm that this is Alzheimer's disease or multi infant dementia, vascular dementia. So they just con pronounce cognitive impairment and then give outpatient appointments. However, very typically, such seniors do not want to go back to hospital again. Okay, And then to... Surely there are many things on her mind, particularly the 56-year-old daughter who has ID. So she declines any kind of um, uh, daycare services as well. Because if you go to daycare services, what is going to happen to my daughter? So there are many, many um, dynamics in this case. So now the question for all of you. Number one, what steps would you take to help someone like Madam Lee? If you are a caseworker or a primary care doctor, looking after her. Say you are the GP and she sees you. Or maybe you are the AAC um, or cluster support case manager and this is under your charge. So would, would I would like to invite all of you to type just any kind of ideas and we will go through. We give ourselves uh, one minute. One to two minutes. See anyone? Yeah. Let me see. Yeah. Uh, um, okay. Somebody say link her up with active aging center near her home. Maybe she says she don't want to go, but let's just put it up. Anybody else? I can't see other chat more. Um, let's see. Ah, yes. Um, you can also type in the Q&A site. Nah. So I saw uh, Lydia write, provide care for her ID daughter so that she'll attend daycare center. Yes, that's a good thought. Ah, the chat is disabled. We have, uh, we have someone who is uh, uh, raised their hand and they want to contribute. Ah, okay, good. So, uh, can we unmute the person who raised a hand? I'll just read out the um what is typed. Huh? So, take care of the ID okay, daughter. The okay. okay. Then Louis say both daughter and mom. Can go to daycare, can appeal to AIC. 
So AIC is with us today. <laughs> Um, sure. I mean, if it's AAC, there's no criteria. Daycare center, there is some criteria, right? You must be certain degree of disability. Um, ask about her other needs besides just her medical needs. Indeed, huh? if you want to help her, you need to know what are the needs, right? Engage befriender to assist both. So um, straight away, we get befriender because we assume she may be isolated and lonely or at least somebody to engage as a befriender. Maybe, huh? so let's uh, then send the daughter to mines in the daytime. But depends on the degree of uh, intellectual disability. His mild mind may not be the right thing. Okay, then uh, Miwen says, understand what she wants and prioritize the need. So we have to find out what she wants and prioritize. Maybe what she wants is nothing from us. <laughs> or maybe she has got cognitive impairment. She may not be able to fully express the areas which are important but to her may not be important but to a professional it is important right initial acp discussion yes especially about future planning for the daughter and herself check in on her neighbors or community friends if anyone is involved with helping her daily needs yes so um Oleander, I suspect you may be a social worker or at least, you know, experience in community. A lot of time, we need to involve neighbours and uh, informal support. Check on Kara daily, daily routine. If only she's open to us, get social worker to help. The social worker will go in, but what would the social worker do? What are the steps, right? Support social support, meals, housekeeping, whether she needs that, right? But she has difficulty going out, probably she needs it but we will probably need to assess as well. So introduce the client to the nearest AAC. Ask her what is the most important for well-being at the stage. Refer community case manager, befriender, check her support system. Okay, let us stop, close the discussion for this particular question now because I got two more, very challenging one. So what I can hear from all of you is that we need, we cannot just look at her as individual. We have to think of her and her daughter as a unit. They both of them definitely need some kind of community support. Maybe we can start with a social worker. But imagine you're the social worker. What should you start? Because you are referred to. Who can you refer to? You know. So as a case worker or social worker, where do you start? So somebody say you do be refer to befriender, but is that what she needs? So somebody says we have to identify the needs and the priorities. Then we link up the services. So that is... Maybe if you have a relationship, you can do that. If you haven't got a trust, she may not open the door to you as well. But then again, if I have a trust with her, if there's a relationship and if I'm a doctor that she trusts, the first thing I'll do is, I mean, that's my thought, is also to do a comprehensive needs assessment. If I'm a doctor, I'll do a comprehensive geriatric assessment because I have the benefit of identifying medical condition, making diagnoses where there aren't, and making prognosis and disease trajectory, review medicines, these are the things that doctor can do. But if you're not a doctor, you can still do the rest, you know, function, psycho, emotional, social, and so on. So we still need to do a needs assessment. Okay, the second scenario is a little bit more difficult. It is for those of you here who is ever like managing a company or a clinic or a business or an agency. So the scenario is like this, but any one of you can participate in this discussion. You are a manager of an AAC. You have two case managers, each handling 25 clients equally. You know? One of them says her clients are more complex and feels overwhelmed. Madam Lee is actually one of her clients. And when you are the manager, you compare their cases. This manager who complains have less cat three and four clients than the other one. So how do you assess whether the complainant's cases are indeed more complex? I don't know whether you have this ex experience before. So would anybody like to just type and suggest what do you think, how do you assess that the caseworkers' cases are really more complex? Okay, you can type onto the Q&A. Okay, just now somebody said, check the mental capacity. Yes, indeed. Nah. If no mental capacity, then what? We take over. <laughs> or refer to APS. So mild cognitive impairment, usually they do have capacity related to certain things. So uh, it would be very hard for a case worker to forcibly send her to a nursing home or something. It's, it's not practical, la, unless the mental capacity is really serious, then we have to invoke the APS. 
Loi Fong Kien says that uh, possible to refer home care, yes. So uh, if she opens the door, but if she can go out of the house, sometimes home care funding doesn't quite allow because it's not homebound, right? But we can always have a have a kind of a justification. So um okay, the second scenario, how do you um how do you assess complexity? Okay, somebody say compliance of treatment or case management, frequency of follow-up one client. Yes, you can check frequency of follow-up. But then again, I can say that maybe for you as a case worker, you always like to follow up frequently. My other nurse, uh, also very good, you know, only see the patient once every three months. Maybe you are over-servicing. I may, I may blame this complaining case worker. Of course, I won't, but going by the frequency of visits may not be the best, right? Any other thoughts? How do you assess which of the case worker cases are more complex? Say you are a doctor, you are working as a GP, and you're seeing a lot of complex patients, and you feel that the funding is really not enough. How do you argue? Can you count the number of diseases? Or do you check for ADLs. Maybe a person who is more disabled is more difficult to manage. What if the person who is more disabled have very strong family support and the person who is less disabled have less family support? So this is the... Okay, oh, there are more answers coming in. Okay. Miwen says, complexity of a case can be subjective. Perhaps we can justify with a common assessment too. Thank you very much, Miwen. That's also my point. Then another one, uh, anonymous attendee says, look at current intervention plans. Have a way to measure complexity? Okay, so currently it's very hard to measure complexity unless, and we cannot just go by subjectivity. Of course, we can to some extent, but not if the number is big and the money is huge, right? Kairu mm -hmm. says, prioritize urgency of case, needs and support in place. So how do you prioritize urgency? So... In a way, these are all very tricky questions. And yet, if you don't resolve it, there will always be, in a way, argument about what is correct funding, right? Jasmine says, are there other social issues like financial needs? In a way, complexity is contributed by clinical, social, emotional, functional, and so on, right? Many, many factors. But how do you weigh them in into a score? So... Thanks for participation. It is not an easy answer. And uh, perhaps that's why uh, um, many years ago, I was, uh, Dr. Xiong was my boss at that time. Um, there was a need for a home community doctor like me to see patients every two months. Then I felt that, hey, with some patients, I only need to see once every three months or six months because they're so stable. Some cases I need to see even more frequently. Why should I be seeing all patients two monthly? But, you know, you have to have some kind of standard, but the standard needs to be rational. So that's why the question was a very a tough one. If you're working in the community, you will see this. The third question is even higher level. So this one, um, imagine you're a director, a CEO, or a medical director, or a director of a care agency or a GP group, for example, that provides health and social care support for frail elders. You pride yourself for providing person-centered care of high quality. You have doctors, nurses, social workers, psychologists, and have an old, whole army of OTs, PTs, and STs. Must be very costly to run your operation. Your cost per patient is high, and the ministry, as well as your board chairman, is concerned that you may be over-servicing. However, oh, how should you demonstrate to yourself as well as your funders that you are not a Rolls-Royce service? For example, a client like Madam Lee, your social worker spends a long time building rapport in order to connect her with the services in the community, including cognitive therapy, exercise program, and so on, before you provide rehab services to her. You know the accusation that your Rolls-Royce service is not fair. But how do you prove that? So are there anyone with any thoughts you can type into the Q&A chat? So this one, if you can answer this, maybe you can be promoted. <laughs> no, just joking. But it's a tricky problem. Imagine you run a charity and then you are, you know, you, you're driven by your passion. 
and then you create this very beautiful service. And for just for somebody to say that, ah, yeah, yours is too expensive. And on the ground, you know, if you don't do that, this person is going to go into the hospital again and again or fall through the crack. And then you don't have the heart for this. But the funder only pay you this amount because they don't they think that you are over-servicing. Then you have to raise funds to cover the extra delta. And it's very frustrating because people don't understand how it is like caring for somebody like Madam Lee on the ground. So how would you prove that you are not over-servicing? Okay, I got one response, I think. Uh, a way to measure improvement in client functioning, social functioning, but with a comparison with others. Sounds really hard to execute though. Indeed, indeed. Huh? So it requires almost like a whole society effort. Another um, attendee says, anonymous, look at the outcomes after the intervention. How Madam Lee has improved after the intervention. The issue is sometimes, uh, for example, very few others, no matter how you rehab, the butter index never changed, you know, only decline because of aging. Also, sometimes depression, uh, you treat and treat, they are still depressed. It's just that maybe some score are sensitive, you can find that you improve, but certain score don't change. So we it's also very hard to prove. But then the nurse or the doctor on the ground, we can really feel the impact, but we don't know how to articulate. Whereas we need evidence also. And me won't say, talk to funders and justify evidence-based care model. Yes, yeah, so you need to collect evidence. So we need to research, we need to evaluate. But research and evaluate, you need to compare, right? Some kind of comparison, whether randomized controlled trial, which is quite impractical in the community, or some kind of mixed method research where the evidence is scientific and convincing. Louis says, provide a list of resources that contribute to the agency, as well as the individual strength and perspectives. Yes, maybe we don't prove, we just raise funds. That's another way of doing it. Not wrong, huh? but after a while, you feel that only you can do, nobody else can do. And only this part of Singapore um, experience this good service, the rest of Singapore cannot. So, so these are the, um, I'll, I'll just stop here for the brainstorm, but thank you very much for your participation. They're all very interesting uh, uh, suggestions from you. And uh, the answers in the subsequent installment where I talk about how to interpret, how do you do care planning, may cover a little bit, but also later when you hear Kat Faiza sharing on the AIC's plan as well as the things that Interact can do, you may also get some idea. Okay? So now I'll just carry on with my subsequent few more slides before I hand over to Faiza. Why do we use assessment tools and not just clinical assessment, right? There are seven good reasons here. Assessment tools provide specificity and uniformity. It can quantify, I can measure numbers. I can, because the number, I may be able to monitor changes over time, provided it's sensitive and specific enough. In a population with limited resources, we have to screen for people to focus our resources, just like how the National Strategy on Fruity uses CFS, Clinical Fruity Scale. Four and five ICOP screening tool. Six onwards, straight away CGA. Four and five, ice cream screening positive, CGA. So you need a screening to identify target group. Useful as an organizing tool. If you use assessment tools, I can organize resources. I can say people with CFS 7 or 7 and 8, I have more resources. 5 and 6, less resources. So I can organize it like this. For program evaluation, because you want to compare apples with apples, you want to use the same ruler to compare. And also you can use as a feedback. If I have a... It's like how last time, many years ago, when people still read magazines and then they do some kind of personality or psychological test, when you test it and they tell you what kind of personality you are similarly, use assessment tools, I can use it to feedback to the patient, the caregivers, and the providers. Why use standardized comprehensive assessment? Actually, I think I have overrun my time. Uh, Faiza will be repeating this, but let me go through these 12 good reasons very quickly. Why use standardized comprehensive geriatric assessment? For the clinician, we have consistency in quality and domains of the comprehensive geriatric assessment, even if it is conducted by whether doctor, nurse, PTOT, or whether conducted by different nurses, you have consistency in quality. Consistency in triggering of problems or care for care after it is done. Okay? 
bare minimum data set to replace the multitude of assessment tools so that we can improve productivity without compromising on quality. So the last time when I implemented this in my previous organization, we cut down on a lot of unnecessary tools as well as the doctor's assessment was shortened because we introduced a standardized assessment tools. Assessment should be relevant to the older person and practical to the health and social case workers, or not assessment just for academic purpose. Good if the assessment satisfies many clinical needs. So one assessment to do many, many things so that I don't have to do something for care planning purpose, another thing for evaluation and research, something else for funding, you know. For service manager, you can be confident of consistency and quality. And you can have a view of case mix. Roughly, you can see which ward or which nurse or which doctors have the more cost-intensive cases. And I can have consistent data for continual quality improvements, DQI. And if you're a program director, I have reliable data for case mix. Case mix is a technical term for health economics, which is people of the same resource are grouped together into one case mix. So it's not about whether you have diabetes or high blood pressure, but how what's the amount of money or resources needed to support somebody like you? This is case mix. Then the outcome measures and so on. So I can know what is the best way to invest so that I know what are the return on investment. It's not about money or time, it's about value, right? Cross facilities comparison requires standardized assessment and good data to help identify gaps and new population needs. And you can have proper equitable means fair, fair funding for, for outcome oriented funding and clinical audit and so on. So eight good reasons why you're using it, right? Because it's evidence-based, there are more than a billion cases. It was in 2015, there were more than billions. Now it's 2024, there are even more than a billion already. And it's very well published. The entire fellows are experts in leaders in the field. There are many prominent geriatricians, um, uh, nurses, social workers, OTs, uh, pediatricians, palliative care physicians, mathematicians, and so on. There are a full range of instruments from primary care all the way to palliative care. Later, Faiza will explain what, why the... the instruments are very useful. The decision support algorithm help us generate scales and protocols, which is evidence-based. We can use it for care planning. Many of the scales have been cross walked with traditional instruments like Bartel, like MMSE, like FIM, FIM. And the protocols are developed by clinicians and thought leaders. Evidence-based support for financial needs as well as quality indicators. And we can also do international benchmarking. So why not interact, right? It's so good, why not interact? Because it's a lot. And if you want to adopt it, there's a lot to let go. So it is really, the stakes are really high and interact is not easy to implement. So now I will stop here. We will have a Q&A after the next segment by Faiza. So Faiza is... um. As I understand, he's a leader in the in our development of Interi. Of course, she's not alone. She's working a team in AIC in the implementation and so on. So maybe Faiza could share with us on uh um introduce us to Interi assessment tool. Hi. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Hey, thanks, Wai Chong. Uh, uh, I actually, some of my, my slides will uh, sort of overlap a little bit, but uh, I try to cut it down. Uh, hi, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you to HNF as well as, as Dr. Ng Wai Chong uh, for inviting me to share on uh, what we have done um, with interim implementation. Let me just share my screen. Give me a moment. Hmm. Can see my screen, yeah, Rachel. Good, okay. 
Hi everyone. Uh, sorry if it's a little bit background noise. I'm actually having a Hari Raya gathering at the same time. I forgot the dates got mixed up. So I actually is hosting quite a lot of people at home. So just bear with me. But um, yeah. They can participate and get CME points. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. And then they'll say, what are you doing? <laughs> okay, anyway, just a quick introduction of today's presentation. I will be talking about one, why um just just like an extension of what Wai Chong was mentioning on the need to standardize care assessment. A little bit more about Interi as well as I will cover on uh, what the government is, or uh, rather MOH, is helping us to support in the implementation of Interi. Right, so why why do we actually need um to to look at standardizing care assessment. And, and Wai Chong, I think, have mentioned a lot about, you know, uh, people using different, and I also see in the chat group that people were mentioning that, you know, maybe look at outcomes, how do we measure, uh, how, how do we tell the funder that, you know, the cases that we take are actually quite tough. And actually what happened is that many years ago, uh, about maybe five years ago, AIC actually were trying to look at um, what are the assessment tools that people are using? So we did a survey and we wanted to know uh, what are the tools people are using uh, today uh, for the care assessment. And in that uh, survey, we realized that there were more than 100 tools being used and, and a lot more like, you know, within the clinical itself, within the different domains like cognition and things like that, there were variation of tools. So there were, a standardization was a bit difficult uh, and and so and so with that right if you do not have standardization of assessment what does it mean right so you will find that there'll be duplication of assessment across care setting for the resident and the client you know when they move from one sector to another section or another provider to another provider another assessment has to be done because the assessment may be different uh, and because of that you know there will be some fragmentation of care planning because it was not standardized and and care planning we know depends on the clinician um, and then um, therefore we are we are finding it difficult to measure that quality of care and then with that right the, the the data analysis becomes a bit difficult and we all know today data has a lot of power and and I think that is why the usefulness of using a standardized care assessment is one of that and because of our services over the years and you remember when AIC started you know I've been with AIC for 15 years when I started in AIC we were only 30 staff doing only three types of services but now you know as the care services evolve um, people looking at how to really look after the elderly in the community and we find that for cost effective care as well a standardized care assessment then becomes really really important and therefore with that uh, notion uh, MOH and AIC then form a, a work group and uh, this was way back before COVID in 2018 to look at um, the different types of tools that are available in the market today, we don't actually decide on Interact just like that. We actually did a lot of literature search, look us about three months to compare the different domains of tools, whether it is a battery of tools that you take, like, you know, for function, you take into consideration using MBI or FIM, and then for cognition, MMSE and all that. So we try to look at whether the battery of tools work or whether a, better to use a single dom multi-domain assessment tool where you have all the domains inside one assessment tool. And after a lot of deliberation, the, the work group decided that, yes, the approach to using a standardized care assessment should be a single multi-domain tool. That means a tool that has got all the domains inside it. And then when we also compare a single multi-domain tool, and Interi still meets the, the requirement for a care assessment. And therefore, since then, ministry have then um, uh, appointed AIC to actually then implement Interi. Now, so what is the usefulness of a standardized care assessment? I think Wai Chong has mentioned earlier, but to me is that as a client, if today I do an interact assessment at point A and the person goes to point B and I have an assessment that's already been done and is standardized because point B also used the same, the same assessment tool, then they do not really have to keep asking the resident or the client certain assessment again. And also what we feel is that you, we realize that you know when you are doing a standardized assessment, uh, most of the domains are already covered. You do not miss certain domains uh, in 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 the uh, for in assessing the client, and for service providers actually, if you have a good um um 
IT system that enable to, you know, the data to flow across. If let's say you are a, an organization that has got multiple uh, service, so you, you can see at large, you know, what kind of um, uh, assessment, the standardization data can tell you, and it actually reduces assessment duplication. That's very important because we do not, one to people to duplicate assessments again. And then of course for the healthcare sector, it means largely it is the, the data that they can collect uh, via the standardized assessment. So that that in a nutshell covers what we think uh, the what we actually realize the importance of a standardizing uh, the care assessment. I move on to my topic uh, next one on interi. Um I think interi some people said oh it's the is the word now. Some people say, oh, it comes already to see me. Um, so yeah, so the many mixed feelings of, of the word inter, right? So yeah, so me and White Chow, we are both inter right fellow and we can feel it like, you know, oh, some people just like feel like they want to throw stones at you because you want to put in, implement inter right in Singapore. But we we believe on the quality of the assessment. And because inter right actually uh, has been established for many years, way back in 1990, 35 countries using it, how bad can it be? Um, and also we feel that because Interi provide this very unique benefit, right, that you use this assessment once and you can actually, I mean, you, you collect this assessment, you do it once, but you can actually use it for multiple times. And what I mean by that is that, uh, in, I will I will, as as I go through and 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 you know uh, share on the what is a fully. Uh, interi system can give you, you realize that, okay, I can do one assessment and what does the benefit of interi comes thereafter. Now, a quick one, interi has got all these multiple tools at different care sectors. If you look at the, the, the types of tool, it is actually very relevant to that sector. And therefore, you know, they have acute care, home and community. Uh, they're very big on mental health, actually. So they've got the variable mental health, tool, which even covers a young youth, uh, as well as young adults. Uh. And then they've got one for post-acute care, long-term care that's that's going to be used for nursing home and also have developed a new, new one for care, caregiver. Now, so you see those stars, uh, which is the checkup, home care, as well as the LTCF will be used in Singapore. So we will be implementing, I will share it a bit later, uh, our strategy of implementation. Now, so if when I say that interact is a standardized language, right? So it's one assessment. So what it means is that if you look across interact uh, uh, various tools, uh, so let I just give an example of what we are going to use in Singapore, which is the checkup, the home care, which will be used in the com community. Checkup will be used as needs assessment as well in the community. And the LTCF, which will be used in the nursing home. Now, if you look at the different domains on my lab, which is the patient identification and all that. Now, uh, these are standard domains within Interi, and some of these domains are available across all the settings. And therefore, how we have made it more um, feasible on the ground when we implement Interact is to support it with an IT enablement. Therefore, that if you move from one Interact uh, tool to another, the items that standard and are available will be copied over into your, your new assessment. And your, your role as an assessor is just to verify that it is still uh, the same as what you're doing the assessment. So, so you can see that because of this standardization, it actually prevents too many duplication of assessment and domains, right? So, so yeah. So this in a nutshell, a summary of the the standard items within it. Of course, if you see more thick, right, that means the assessment is actually more comprehensive. Okay, because the more ticks also give you more out outcomes, lah, that you need to measure. Okay, so like I said earlier, this is the um what interi can do in one assessment and what will then be the outputs that you can get. Um, number one and number two are uh, actually is a value at a client level, at a patient level. So you complete these uh, 200 over questions or uh, 100 over questions within the interi, which covers all the domain. It has got an interi system that you key inside. Of course, if you're trained quite um, uh, you have been quite used to doing interi, you can go straight into the system. You don't have to copy from hard copy into the system. And the system will automatically generate for you uh, because it has got an inbuilt algorithm, which is uh, interi's IP, right? 
and it will tell you uh, two measurement outcome scale because this outcome scale is in a form of number it shows you a picture of a person's needs and functioning so example like your mbi it comes with your mbi score uh, it's the same for interi for function there's certain score so number two is clinical assessment protocols. Um, you know, this I'm more like to use all these long, long name. Lah. It's basically, it's uh, a caps for short, and it is actually, uh, it will trigger for you area of care needs. So like my, uh, what you mentioned, care for Kai. So, so automatically, the interact algorithm will tell you these are areas uh, that the clinicians or the, the care workers, uh, care, case managers can then say, oh, I need to manage falls, pressure ulcer or social support or even this person is not active, you know, some activity promotion. So so that's what the value of doing an interact assessment uh, for the, the client care. Then, of course, as an organization, what is it for me? Now, it, it comes up for an, an organization level quality indicators. Um, and, and these quality indicators help you to identify area for, for improvement. So, for example, it will turn out to say that to say that the percentage of your resident, you know, after six months or one year that has got new new uh, pressure injury developed, or you have actually increased the falls between previously to now, or you actually have improved in terms of your continence rate. So, so these quality indicators are also automatically generated within the Interi system. And lastly, which is the favorite topic by Ministry of Health and the Health Finance, is actually the case mix index. It comes out automatically a RUX resource utilization grouping. It will then group the resident or the client into, it gives you a, a, a code and that is set to actually resource. Now that is already internationally benchmarked. However, we cannot just use the international output because in Singapore, we pay our staff differently. We pay our professionals differently because it's like tech to the, so if let's say your PT, you spend six hours with a PT and your PT costs you how much, that's how they tag the resource utilization too. However, we are developing our own local Singapore-based uh, resource utilization groups. Uh, we are working with health, health finance, but of course it will take quite some time like, because we need to have some data run in before then we come up with it. So, so to, in a nutshell, these are the four uh, outcomes that you will get post interact assessment. Uh, my slide's not moving. Uh, okay, so I will share with you what is interact assessment now. Okay, so each and every interact instruments come with a manual, the blue book, as well as it, within the blue book, there is also the interact forms. Now, interact uh, home care is actually very comprehensive. There's about um, a few, like about 20 assessment domain, and you, you need about an hour to complete it. Um, and, you know, with every manual, it will tell you how to actually score uh, inside the assessment. Of course, we will provide training at AIC uh, on how to fill up this form. And if you see, um, most of the form, most of the tools that we are using in Singapore has been localized. And uh, so, so most of the, you know, data on uh, profiling and all that are very much uh, local settings. So, so now, like I mentioned, you fill up the form uh, just now and that blue book guided you with the assessment. You put it in the system. It generate you generate for you the outcome scale. And this outcome scale uh, can be used to train uh, a person's improvement. And the list of interact outcome scales are actually a slew of it. it if you look at, at, you know, function, you can look at whether that person, you can measure uh, the ADL uh, of that person uh, looking at also a functional uh, hierarchy scale which combines the ADL and IADL. You can, you can also see the IADL capacity of that person and also they take into consideration certain false algorithm to measure whether the person is at risk or high risk, medium risk or low risk for false. And then there are of course others issues like you know looking at uh, aggressive behavior whether that person can communicate express themselves whether they've got hearing problem vision problem so these are all in a nutshell a lot of the outcome skills that you can uh, that can be generated post interactive so so what is this you know outcome scale it measures for you like i mentioned in the terms of 
uh, 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 in the terms of numbers. So they take into consideration certain assessment item within your functional uh, uh, component uh, domains. And then, you know, uh, it will tell you whether you score 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, or 6. And, you know, uh, in inter the scoring is such that every time it is a lower score, it's the best. Higher means you have higher care needs, right? So a 6 is always a, someone who is totally dependent in terms of ADL. Now, so I am showing you here is how people can use the outcome scale over the time to trend, all right, the improvement or actually if your resident uh, plateau or whether they actually decline in terms of certain needs. Lah. And you can actually, this is a snapshot of the system that we have built in and you know how the system that comes also with a report function, you can generate yourself to then track over time and trend uh, how your resident or your client is doing. So that's how you use the outcome scale from Interi. Number two, I mentioned earlier about how you use Interi for care planning. Uh, then uh, it's auto automatically generate for you area that you need to address in terms of looking after this person. And uh, when it triggers, it will also... There are three dimensions to the trigger. One is that you can use it to um, resolve existing problem. It is triggered because there's a, there's a possibility of that you reduce the risk of decline or there is a possibility of improvement. So not everyone gets triggered. Uh, you know, triggered means there is something that you can do to help this person. And for the interact in uh, um, home care, the caps are generated. There are many of them. Um, so... I am a nurse by training, a geriatric uh, background, and therefore um, I think what I find very useful is that it really don't, don't just look at the clinical part, it is really a biopsychosocial uh, outcomes that you get from interact even as not being, say, a social worker or a clinical psychologist that I can understand certain uh, certain outputs that I can use in the, for my own uh, uh, resident or client's care plan. So, so um, okay, so what we have done further at AIC as well as working with a team of providers is that we look at how do we then um, apply it on the ground uh, to help the, 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 the care workers, the nurses, uh, PTOC and all that on the ground is to use these outputs. And we have developed like a library of care plans uh, to help them and built it in the system. And this is the, the, this example of how uh, the library and the care plans actually triggers them. Um, so the my next uh, instrument that I run through quickly is the checkup. It's very similar, uh, but checkup is actually a lot uh, simpler. We, there's only a subset of the home care. It is going to be implemented uh, in Singapore in future as a needs assessment. And, and again, checkup has got a manual as well as a form. And, and then it also comes up with the same output. Uh, but of course, that lesser output than the home care because the questions are much lesser. So uh, these are the outputs that, that you get from Interi, um, uh, Interi uh, checkup. Uh, and these are the caps that you get triggered. La. Okay, so I, I thought that I take a quick, um, I, I wanted to show you that how the outputs of Interi, like I mentioned, can be used to track the outcomes as well as the care planning. It will be built in the system in this manner. Um, when the staff has a conversation, do an assessment, they will key into the system which generate for you the inbuilt algorithm. It will be displayed like you see now on the right here, number three, you can see here, these are the bars that show you the record, you know, the clinical outcomes of the person in terms of cognition. For example, it is a moderate impairment and, and this will be taught at at the trading, what does moderate impairment means? And then when you translate this also to care planning, these are areas that you could use to guide you in terms of care planning. I would like to say that this does not take away a clinician's role. You can still add on certain intervention or you can actually uh, take away some of the intervention you, that, that you think is not reliable to your resident, resident or client. So we don't actually... Um, fix it you know uh and 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 definitely it doesn't take away the clinical role of a, a person okay so i thought like i have uh, here a quick snapshot of how we use interact 
at different continuum of care. And one of these examples is actually a, a true example of a, an elderly that, that are actually attending a daycare center in, in Singapore. At that time, we were using Interacheca as a pilot. And then we did some, uh, and, then, and then, you know, with that, we get all the outcomes of Interact. And then we, after which, um uh, the 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 daycare staff was using it for care planning however our elderly actually went uh got got actually worse she had a stroke and then she went into um uh, the hospital but then family couldn't take care of her because i think she lives with a son and therefore with that she then then you know was admitted to a nursing home and happened that 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 nursing home she went to was our pilot site and what i wanted to show to you is that the assessment that was used at the at the daycare center some of the domains then flow over to the ltcf that is done by the nursing home and you can see that some of the assessment that's not available is the only the only ones that the nursing home needs to do but of course they need to verify the one and four so this is how we are trying to say that the interact actually flows from one trajectory to another right Okay, so that's so much about number one and number two, where you actually use interi for client care. In the uh, quality indicators is what that's quite um quite a hot topic that people are quite interested in. And interi, like I mentioned, it actually generate for you automatically uh, from a number of assessments that you use. Uh, we can cut it by organization. We can cut it by um you know groups of organization and all that so how does interact quality works is that it covers certain major domains and many are uh, many different types of um, uh, items and therefore they will use certain of the questions and all that to come up with it and um so for the nursing home itself there are 33 quality indicators uh, that will be generated by interact however we don't need to use all the 33 and today at AIC as well as we're working with the nursing home that they are reviewing the uh, the quality indicators i'm just giving you a snapshot here of how you can actually like in other countries they have been using interi based quality indicator and how the, it looks like in the system and this is something that we want to emulate here in singapore as well um, so that's about quality indicators and last but not least is the value of interi in the terms of funding. Now this is of course the most interested person is of course MOH and of course funders as well as I think organization because they wanted to know how how um high intensity uh, or resource intensity your client is and therefore we are using this very complex resource utilization groupings it is also based on the assessment that you do right so you that is why people need to do a proper and good assessment so that all the outputs can be used by multiple people and multiple needs lah as well as for organization as well. So this is RUX, we call it for short. A very early days, we haven't developed much yet, but we are working first with MOH to change the base funding to interact for nursing home starting from 2027. So we're not going to use RAF anymore. We are moving to 2027 using interact base funding, which we will develop as what we call the Singapore RUX. Yeah, so um, on my last topic, a very uh, quick um, uh, sharing about what are we doing in Singapore in implementing a standardized care assessment. And by standardizing it, we are using Interi for this enabler. Right, so Interi, as you know, will be implemented at, uh, as a standardized care assessment tool for the com care sector. And when I talk about com care sector, we are talking about nursing home, uh, center based, as well as home based care. Um, so we are be, we will be using um uh, we will be implementing Interi in two to be used at two areas. One for care planning, like I mentioned earlier, is very good for client care. Number two is for needs assessment, where Interi will be used at at the point of referral. And how the implementation timeline? We will start in twenty twenty four which is very soon in nursing home in October. So today we have started uh, sector-wide training uh, for nurses, nursing uh, staff, a social worker and all that to be trained in interim. We leave it to the organization to decide who they want to send to the interim training. And then we will roll up because we are training 
about 85 nursing home with about 2,000 staff. So we are training in batches. Uh, we go into waves and all that. But by October, we will have every nursing home or every organization, uh, organization would already have trained assessor to use in the right. And therefore, in 2024, we will roll out uh, in nursing home. When we say roll out means we are not expecting nursing home to do everybody in the right, but giving them chance to actually take over, you know, changing their in-flight residence and all that to change and use in the right. Uh, and then we let nursing home settle for a while. In 2026, we will start to use in the right for referral as well as for um, uh, uh, care planning in center-based and home-based care. So this uh, pictorial uh, description of uh, how we are implementing Interi in the future. And then all this data will be housed for MOH to look at quality, policy review, as well as resource utilization. And how do we support the sector? We cannot just say, oh, you roll up. We roll up Interi. Nah, you go and do Interi, right? No. So what we did is um, we will provide the sectors with free training. And when we say free, it's 100% free. Uh, they don't have to pay anything. We will, they will have to attend the classroom training because it is so important that they do an accurate assessment uh, because the data will be used um, for many, many other uh, aspects. And then not only they attend classroom, once they finish, they will get a certification. Now, this certification actually is recognized internationally. So uh, you're trained in Singapore, you can also practice in the right in New Zealand, but I'm not saying that you must leave Singapore and then you know go to New Zealand. But yes, it is internationally recognized. And not just training, we understand that once you go to classroom training, when you go back to the nursing home or your practice area, you may struggle or you may find, hey, how do I do this? And how do I code this? How do I use this for care planning? That's when AIC, we have a group of trainers who will go down and help to handhold. We will visit the nursing home on a regular basis. We have certain schedule and then we will go back and say, look, I'm here. Let's go and do this enterprise together. And then we will look through the instruments and then look at how we can use it for care planning. And on top of that, we are rolling out an interact IT system and therefore we will also help to onboard all the users in using interact and teach them how to use the system. So these are the three phases of how AIC will be supporting and funded by Ministry of course in implementation of interact. Now, on top of the, the support that we are giving, we understand the importance of an enabler for implementation. So, you know, AIC and, and Ministry, we are just you know, implementing policies and all that, but we understand a lot of the work is on the ground. And whether I implement Interite useful for the ground or not, it is only the ground can tell me. So therefore, what we did was we built what we call a community of practice. And we have about 13 nursing homes represented there, plus a couple of home care and also center-based uh, provider. And the community of practice have played such an important role. If we started it for one year already, Wachong is one of our advisors. Uh, the chairman is Madam Lau, uh, Sister, Sister Susan from Villa Francis, and many other representatives help us to one tell me whether how do I even align the current assessment when I use Interact. So they say, you, you want to implement Interact, this, 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 you don't have to do. So we then went to the system and said, can you gray out in your system so that they don't have to do duplicate assessment, things like that, because the ground people knows better than us. So, so we get them to work with us. They even come up with Kaplan Library, the one that I mentioned in a couple of slides ago. Uh, it is actually developed by the, the community of practice and involve about 22 nursing, uh, nursing homes that comes as in a workshop to help us because we can't do this alone. And therefore, the COP actually becomes our a key enabler in, in the implementation. So, so implementing Interi, uh, apart from providing uh, uh, hand-holding support and training, we also have this uh, uh, practice, uh, uh, committee of practice to help us. So I have come to... Um, uh, the end of my converse, uh, presentation, but a very quick one is that after this, uh, what we will do is AIC will start doing the COP for Comcare. We will repeat the same process that we did for nursing home before we then move on to the community care. And with that, I end my converse. Thank you. Thank you very much, Faiza. Thank you. So let's have a bit of Q&A. We are slightly overrun, but... Uh... True to our tradition, we are usually overrun <laughs> on our okay. webinar. So, um, 
Well, maybe Faisal can unshare this so that I can like see all the panelists. So the um, well, Hi. we have a large room here, 266 of you, and from our registration statistics, about 50 plus to 60 are doctors. So as doctors, you may find this quite confusing and maybe difficult to follow, but I believe that you know why are, why are we doing this and why is it important if you have experience taking care of somebody who is frail or even if your loved ones like your parents or grandparents have been like this. You know doctors play an important role but, but only one of the many roles, one of the many things that's needed. So in caring for the frail others, we know we require a team and care is not the same as cure, of course, mm -hmm. you know, and when a person is frail with multiple diseases, it's really the person, um, uh, caring for the person is more important than treating just the diseases. We know this in principles, but how do we do this? So this is the way that's, that's being um, thought out, you know, deep thinkers, evidence-based, it's like this. So where does the doctor come in? We don't, I don't think we need to do interact assessment itself, but we we will need to work with community partners who are using Interi and they'll come to us. The Interi shows that this person is suspected of having delirium or having cognitive impairment. The doctor role is to make a diagnosis of the de de um, cognitive impairment. Is this dementia or is it just hypothyroidism? Is delirium something serious like, for example, uh, um, a heart attack? Or is it like, um, or is it just due to, um, maybe due to drug interactions? The doctor will have to sort of play along with the team to care for the person. So the case manager perhaps owns the case. The doctor as a, if you're a primary care doctor, you own the case as a medical coordinator of all the specialist appointments. So this is something that I see the role of a doctor. So in this sense, we don't have to learn how to use it, but we need to learn how to, interpret it, how to work as a team with others on this. So in the next two sessions, I will, I will share from a perspective of a doctor, how do we make sense of this, this kind of assessment? And because when we learn geriatrics, we learn how to interpret MMSE, AMT, GDS, Bartel Index, um, maybe uh, Lawton for IDLs and so on. But when it comes to this this way of approaching comprehensive care for the frail elders, how as a doctor we can we can contribute so that our senior patients do not always need to go to A and E just so that they can access home care services. And we can actually assess and refer to our partners, maybe the next door AAC, maybe HNF. Of course, we hope that you can work with HNF. HNF has a full suite of services to support your clients. So, uh, so this is the intention of all this. So now I have one question from the floor. I think it is from an anonymous. Thanks for the excellent tool. Interact tool is quite comprehensive and seems quite time consuming. Is there any criteria which group of clients need to do interi? Okay, I just now Faiza mentioned something in passing. I would just like to share. She mentioned that it takes one hour to do, and um, if you're very experienced with it and your assessment has been quite good, you do not need to do a paper one and transfer to the, the, the IT platform. My own experience is this. I used to work in a home care agency where we used Interact for 10 years and the nurses are very experienced with it. I followed the nurse to do a comprehensive assessment. The nurse, what I observed she do is she talked to the caregivers, talked to the patient if the patient can talk, and then observe the patient move if the patient can walk. If not, then really just do the assessment. And within what well, I carry on with my own assessment with the caregivers and examine the patient, when you go back to office, she could enter all the assessment into the system. So this is how if you know the various domains completely, and especially when the person is home bed bound, not talking, nasogastric tube feeding, the assessment can most of the things you can already answer without going through the survey form as if you're doing, doing a market survey. So it, is, it, it looks very long, but when you're very good at it, it is very intuitive and it doesn't have to be so long. Maybe Faiza could comment. Faiza has been training a lot of people in doing the assessment. Yeah, I, I think I, 
I always like to use this phrase that I find doing an assessment is both the art and the science, right? Yeah. So the science is actually really the tool itself and the art is your ability to do it. So I, in our training, what we do is we always ask them to set the stage. Like, you know, you, you start with the small talk and with that small talk, you can actually start to fill up your assessment already. Like, mm -hmm. oh, what did you eat this morning? You know, and then the caregivers, and then she said, oh, I had, a co I had coffee and, and bread. But the caregivers said, no, she had me rebels or something else you know so you know something is wrong with the cognition and then you uh, then you set your mind and they say oh, okay let me just ask in this manner on that manner so so from certain question you also can can already start to um um we teach them how to yeah. do these interview skills and no not necessarily you follow in the right question section c section d section e whatever in your conversation you can start you can follow on and lead on to your next question so for example if even when when a rest when a person you knock at the door and then they came out and walked towards the door, you already know that this person can walk, right? Whether steady or not steady. And and you already can see, oh, it's four meter, you can already uh, start to come like, oh, she's quite steady and things like that. So so you can actually use many things to yes. actually start filling up your assessment. So some of these soft skills is what I we we sometimes you know teach in class. Lah, and 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 that is why in, in our class we like to put in case scenario. Uh, so that then uh, people can relate to the the because once you before we we okay so in our previous training we actually didn't use case scenario then we started to say hey let's try, try and put it then we realized that when we put in case scenario a lot of discussion comes uh -huh. when we didn't use everybody uh, we thought everybody understood but actually no you know so when we <laughs> tried it so the case scenario like what Wachong did right a thought provoking uh, it is really I think very important in terms of so so our training covers a bit of the soft skill looking at the methods of you know how best to do an assessment thank you Faiza. the second part of this question was whether criteria for doing interrite so you're right interrite is intensive so we don't do it for all seniors so you look at the national strategy for frailty right it recommends mm. that cfs6 and above cfs6 means this person is most likely homebound because right. it's not independent in all adl so yeah. homebound elders, so if you're providing home care, home medical, home nursing, home personal care, or you're running an SCC, senior care centre, and then the person comes to a daycare centre, you should you can do a, a interim, okay? Maybe HC. Currently, we um, I think AIC would uh, would recommend what is the best tool. So you so it's not for every senior, it's for the senior who is most frail, where investment in time like this is worth the while. For seniors who is very active and so on, maybe we don't really have to do this yet. Mm. Yeah. yeah, I, I mean, I, just to add on, um, who needs interi? That is why interi is positioned as a needs assessment yeah. uh, at referral. So if you actually don't have any needs to any services, then uh, you don't need to do interi. Mm -hmm. So obviously, if you touch the fact that you need a referral, yeah. yes, then interi should come in. Yeah. Thank you. Are there any other questions from the floor? In the chat also, uh, okay, um, we we actually overrun. We will have more opportunities to discuss. So next month, we'll be um, uh, Faiza is not free, so I'll be doing one on how do we interpret interpret the scale skills. If you remember what she said, it's a measure of a person's clinical status. It can be a risk. It can be a dimension of a deficits. Um. Or other, so uh, so we, I will, I will, I will share how do we interpret it compared with traditional instruments that we are all like brought up with, you know, and then the third installment, I'll use case studies to illustrate how the triggering of the clinical assessment protocols or careful care or maybe a lot of doctors we like to use the term problem list. So how does interact trigger problem list? And how do we make use of the, the problem list to create a person-centered care plan? I will target mainly the doctors, even though we know interi, the bulk of people using it are not really doctors. But in the future, frail care, as I mentioned, it will have to be a teamwork. So how can doctor can value add to it? There's one more question, I think. Um, okay, yes. Is there a recommendation of how often an interi should be repeated? Maybe, Faiza, what do you think? 
Yeah, okay. So like any other clinical tool, we re Interim recommends a, a, a reassessment after every six months. Uh, so that is also part of the uh, nursing home standards that you actually reassess as well as I think service requirement. Uh, yeah. So Interim is the same every six months. However, if there is a change in condition, then an assessment should be done earlier. Um, or if that client is admitted to a hospital uh, and when they return back to you, we would recommend one because if there is a change, of course, in the condition returning back from hospital because um, it is kept to the care plan. So yeah. I think your care plan should change if there is a change in condition. Yeah, so six monthly or there is a change in condition. Niwen asked a question related to implementation plan. I'm not sure whether Faiza is it convenient for you to answer. Say, when will SPs be notified of the training schedule for nurses? Okay, so uh, nursing homes have been notified um, already uh, for center base, which we will commence in March, April 2026 to roll out. Uh, it, we will be engaging the service provider. MOH will have uh, to, I think there will be one webinar arranged, uh, but if not, we will be uh, notifying the provider uh, and providing uh, training six months before the rollout, mm. and we will be engaging way before that. Mm. Yes. And yes, will somebody replace... Whether, uh, replace the current assessment. Yes, we have worked with MOH uh, strongly with the nursing home particularly uh, because uh, so we work with RCE and audit committee in the nursing home to say that, nah, this is the interact output, please read. And when you look and say where to find the false assessment, it's here. Where to find the pressure risk, it's here. So yes, and they will actually, um, uh, they are aware of it. And then, uh, like I said, funding will change uh, and, and, and service eligibility will also uh, change in future. Yes. Yes. So with that, I think we only have time for the discussion. So thank you, Faiza. And uh, Christina, would you like to close the session? <laughs> thank you, everyone, for your attention. And see you next month. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, Faiza. Thanks, Faiza.